Okay, so this is the second video uh, about the presentation of this work, which is available in the archive. This is a work involving different people from the NSF CCI, from this center that is led by Victor Batista from Yale University. So in that first video, we explain the first term, which is the title, in the title of this work, which is spectral kissing. Now, in this uh, second video, we are going to explain the last words, squeeze care nonlinear oscillator. And we are going to start talking about spontaneous emission. And so, as you know, when we have an atom that is excited, it's not going to stay there forever. It will eventually get rid of this excess of energy in the form of photons. So this process is irreversible. This process is uncontrollable. And this process is possible because this atom is not completely isolated. It's embedded in, a, um, in vacuum fluctuations. Now, so the photon has many channels to decay. It has many vacuum modes in which it can go. But if we pick this excited atom and we put it now in a cavity, you now where we have these uh, reflecting walls, we are now going to be changing. We are going to be modifying these available vacuum modes. And with that, we can now control the spontaneous emission. So we can um, delay it or we can accelerate that. And so uh, this kind of platform is a very good platform is a very good environment to study the interaction between light and matter. And this kind of studies that are done in these uh, cavities is known as cavity quantum electrodynamics, cavity QED. Well, now inspired by the cavity QEDs, people started studying what is known as circuit QED. So again, it's an excellent platform to study the interaction between light and matter. What is going to change? Well, now we are going to be dealing with microwave photons, so not, not optical light, light anymore, microwave photons, but more important than that, we are not going to be dealing with atoms. Instead, we are going to be dealing with circuits, and where these circuits uh, they like represent atoms, is what people call artificial atoms. So let's have a look at some possible circuits. Well, let's start with a simple one, the LC circuit. So here we have an inductor and a capacitor. If this capacitor is um, um, charged, once we close the circuit, it will, will have a current. This current will create a flux in the inductor. The change of flux will induce a current, which will then recharge our capacitor, and we go on like that. So the Hamiltonian that describes the system is given here. We can see the charge as momentum. We can see the flux as the coordinate. And if this circuit is very small, these two uh, variables will no longer commute. Okay, so now we have a quantum circuit. As we said, flux can be seen as coordinate. I'm writing it now here in terms of creation and annihilation operator. Charge can be seen as momentum, and we are using creation and annihilation operators. So now we can write this Hamiltonian, the quantum counterpart of this Hamiltonian like this. We have a quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay. Now you can say, well, how about the resistance? It's true. We have to take into account losses, but if this circuit is at very low temperature, the resistance will vanish. The circuit becomes a superconducting. Instead of electrons, we'll be dealing with Cooper pairs. Okay, so we have this quantum harmonic oscillator. Very good. But for people who are trying to use these circuits uh, to build quantum computers, well, this is not the best choice. Why? This kind of circuit is not a good quantum bit, qubit. Why? Because in a qubit, we want to play with two levels. Now we want to manipulate two levels. And uh, we want to have to control over these two levels. But here, any pair, uh, any two adjacent levels have the same uh, spacing, huh? the same energy difference. So we do not have control over two 
only. No? So these uh, energy levels are not addressable. To change that, we need to add some nonlinear term to our circuit. So how are we going to do that? We are going to remove the inductor and place in its place, no? put in its place a Josephson junction. And what is that? Well, we have two superconductors separated by a thin um, layer of an insulator. So then the Cooper pair can tunnel. Once we add the Josephson junction, we change the Hamiltonian. Instead of having the flux square, now we have cosine of the flux. So this system is equivalent not to a harmonic oscillator, but to a pendulum. Remember the pendulum. And so here we have the pendulum. We have uh, the, uh, the gravitational force. The component of this gravitational force, which will allow this mo mo uh, movement, is this sine of theta. And so that means that the potential is cosine of theta. Well, here that's what we have, cosine of the flux, right? If this angle is very small, or if this flux is very small, then we can treat our pendulum, then we can treat this system as a harmonic oscillator. But if the flux is not as small, or if the angle is not as small, we have to take into account these nonlinearities. Okay? So we now have an oscillator which is not harmonic. We have an unharmonic oscillator. So the spacings are not all equal, they are different. And this is very good for people who are after qubits because now we have selective transition between the levels. Now the levels are addressable. We can focus on just the ground state and the first excited state. And here we have our qubit. And this is known as transmon qubit. And so this is the qubit of many existing uh, quantum computers such as the IBM quantum computer. Very good. This is the system that we'll be playing with. But what we've been doing, or we've been trying to do in this center is go beyond these two levels. We have all of these other many levels, which are very much controllable. Now this, uh, the experiment, the experimentalists have control over these higher levels as well. So what can we do with that? Now, what are the problems, the problems in physics, problems in chemistry that we can uh, solve with systems like that, or new problems that we can uncover with systems like that. So this is what we are after in the CCI in this center. Okay. The, so the first step is playing with this, all of these levels, and then more interesting, more complex, is coupling different kinds of these um, nonlinear um, oscillators. Okay. Very well. So. This is the Hamiltonian, as we said. We can see uh, the charge as momentum. We can see the flux as coordinate. Well, if we now expand this cosine, the first term, the first correction that will appear, the first correction to the harmonic of data is this term here. This is the same term that we see that we find in nonlinear optics when we have a very strong, a very intense um, um, uh, light. Now, when we have very intense light, we give rise to this effect, which is known as care effect. Okay, so because this is the first term that appears here, we will be calling our nonlinear oscillator care nonlinear oscillator. Okay, so this is the origin of this uh, name. So this is why we have this title. No, this names in, a, in the title of our uh, work. Now, in addition to this oscillator, what we are going to do is add a microwave drive. Okay. Now, we play with this Hamiltonian, um, manipulate, change the frame, go into a rotating frame, and the Hamiltonian that we end up with, the effective Hamiltonian that describes this driven system is this one. Okay, so K here is the care nonlinearity that we mentioned, and this is the drive, is, come, is what we have from this additional drive. And so this epsilon two is the squeezing amplitude. This is the Hamiltonian that we'll be dealing with, okay? So we reach the point where we explain the last term of the title of this uh, work, 
squeezed care nonlinear oscillator. And this is the end of the second um, part of this presentation.